Hey, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're at Data Privacy Day 2018. I still can't believe it's 2018 in downtown San Francisco. Uh, at LinkedIn's headquarters, a new headquarters, a beautiful building just down the road from the Salesforce building, from the new Moscone that's being done. There's a lot of uh, exciting things going on in San Francisco, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about data privacy, and we're excited to have a return visit from last year's CUBE alumni. She's Eve Velasquez, President and CEO, Identity Theft Resource Center. Great to see you again. Thank you for having me back. Absolutely, so it's been a year. What's been going on in the last year in your world? Well, you know, identity theft hasn't gone away. Shoot. And data. I you told me it was last I time. I know, I wish. And in <laughs> fact, unfortunately, we just released our data breach information and there was a tremendous growth. It was a little over a thousand uh, previous year and over 1,500 data breaches in 2017. We're almost so. immune, they're like every day. And it used to be like big news, now it's like not only was Yahoo breached at yeah. some level, which we heard about a while ago, but then we hear they were actually breached like 100%. There is some fatigue, but I can tell you that it's not as pervasive as you might think. Our call center had such a tremendous spike in calls uh, during the Equifax breach. It was the largest number of calls we'd had in a month since we've been measuring our call volume. Right. So people were still very, very concerned. But a lot of us who are in this space are feeling, I think we may be feeling the fatigue more than your average consumer out there. Because right. for a lot of folks, it's really the, the first exposure to it. There's, we're still having a lot of first exposures to a lot of these issues. So the Equifax one is interesting because most people don't have a direct relationship with Equifax, I don't think. They're, I'm not a direct paying customer. I did not choose to do business with them. But as one of the two or three main reporting agencies, right, they've got mm -hmm. data on everybody for their customers who are the banks, financial institutions. So how does that relationship get Oh my gosh, there's so managed? much meat there. There's so oh, much meat I know. there. Okay, so while it feels like you don't have a direct relationship with the credit reporting agencies, you actually do, you get a benefit from the services that they're providing to you. And every time you get a loan, I mean, this is a great conversation for Data Privacy Day because when you get a loan, get a credit card, and you sign those terms and conditions, guess what? They're in you there. are giving that Damn retailer, it. that lender, the authority to send that information over to the credit reporting agencies. And let's not forget that the uh, intention of forming the credit reporting agencies was for better lending practices so that your credit worthiness was not determined by things like your, your gender, your race, your religion, and those types of really, I won't say arbitrary, but uh, just not pertinent factors. Right. Now your credit worthiness is determined by your past history of do you pay your bills? Uh, what is your income? Do you have the ability to pay? So it started with a, a good, very, good purpose in mind and and we definitely bought into that as a society and I, I don't want to sound like I'm defending the credit reporting agencies and all of their behavior out there because I do think there are some changes that need to be made but we do get a benefit from the credit reporting agencies like instant credit right. much faster um, turnaround when we need those financial tools I mean that's just the reality right, of it right so so <laughs> Who is, who is the person that's then um, been breached, been penalized, I'm trying to think of the right, right word of the relationship between those who've had their data hacked from the person who was hacked, if it's this kind of indirect third party relationship oh, through an authorization through the credit card company. No, the, the re Equifax is absolutely responsible. So who would be the litigant, just maybe that's the, the word that's coming to me in terms of feeling the, the pain. Was, is it me as the holder of the Bank of America MasterCard? Is it Bank of America as the issuer of the MasterCard? Or is it MasterCard in, in terms of retribution back to Equifax. In well, this you know, example. I can't really comment on who actually would have the the strongest legal liability. But what I can say is this is the same thing I say when I talk to banks about um, identity theft victims. There's some discussion about, well, no, it's the bank that's the victim in existing account identity theft because 
they are the ones that are absorbing the financial losses, not the person whose data it belongs to. Yet the person who owns that data, there it's their identity credentials that right, have been compromised. Right. They are dealing with issues as well, above and beyond just the financial compromise. They have to deal with cleaning up other um, messes and other records, and there's time spent on the phone. So it, it's not mutually exclusive. They're both. They're right. both victims of this situation. And with data breaches, Often, the breached entity, again, I hate to sound like an apologist, but I am keeping this real. A breached entity, when they're hacked, they are a victim. A hacker has committed that crime and right, gone right. you know, into their systems. Yes, they have a responsibility to make those security systems as robust as possible, but the person who, um, whose identity credentials those are, they are the victim. Any entity or institution, if, it, if it's payment card data that's compromised and a financial services institution has to replace that data, guess what? They're a victim, too. That's what makes this issue and this crime so terrible is that it has these tentacles right. that reach down and touch more than one person for each incident. Right. It's, and then there's a whole other level, which we talked about before we got started, that we want to dig into, and that's children. Um, Recently, a little roar was raised with, you know, kind of these IoT connected toys um, mm. and just a big giant privacy <laughs> hole into your kid's bedroom um, with eyes and ears and, 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 and everything else. So I wonder if we, you know, you've got some specific thoughts on how that landscape is evolving. Well, we have to think about the, the data that we're creating that does comprise our identity. And when we start talking about these uh, toys and, and other uh, internet connected IoT devices that we're putting in our children's bedroom, it actually does make the advocacy part of me, it makes the, the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Because the more data that we create, the more that it's vulnerable, the more that it's used to comprise our identity. And we have a big enough problem with child identity theft just now, right now as it stands, without adding the rest of these challenges. Child and synthetic identity theft are, are a huge problem, and that's where a specific social security number is submitted and has a credit profile built around it when it can either be completely made up or it belongs to a child. And so you have a four-year-old whose social security number is now having a credit profile built around it Obviously, they're not. The thieves are not submitting this. This belongs to a four-year-old. It would not be issued credit. Right. So right. they're saying it's a you know twenty-three-year-old in a different the state. They're grabbing the number. They're using the name. They build this credit profile. And the, the biggest problem is we really haven't modernized how we're authenticating this this information and this data. I think it's interesting and fitting that we're talking about this on Data Privacy Day because the solution here is actually to share data. It's to share it more. And that's an important part of this whole conversation. We need to be smart about how we share our data. So yes, please have a thoughtful uh, conversation with yourself and with your family about what are the types of data that you want to share and keep, and what do you want to keep private. But then culturally, we need to look at smart ways to uh, open up some data sharing, particularly for these legitimate uses for, for fraud detection and prevention. Okay, so you said way too much there because there's like 87 follow-up questions in my head. So we'll <laughs> step back a couple. So, so is that synthetic identity then? Is that what you meant when you said a synthetic identity problem where it's the social security number of a four-year-old that's then used to construct this, I mean, it's the four-year-old social security number, right. but a person that doesn't really exist? Yes, uh, all child identity theft is synthetic identity theft, but not all synthetic identity theft is child identity theft. Sometimes it can just be that the number's been made up. It doesn't actually belong to anyone. Now, eventually, maybe it will. We are hearing from um, more and more parents. I'm not going to say this is happening all the time, but I'm starting to hear it a little bit more often, where the num social security number is being issued to their child. They go to file their taxes. So this child is less than a year old, and they are finding out that that number has a credit history associated with it that was associated years ago. So before that number just, somebody was just generated the number. Just made number. it up. So are we ready to be done with social security numbers? I mean, for God's sake. I've, I've read numerous things, like the nine-digit number that's printed on a little piece of paper is not protectable 
period. And then I've even had I've even had cases where they say, bring your card, bring your little paper card that you, that they gave you at the hospital. And I won't tell you what year that was a long time ago. I'm like, I mean, come on, it's 2018. Should that still be you the anchor? Super read my mind. Data it was point like that I was putting is? that question oh, in your head. Oh, it just head. kills me. I've actually been talking quite a bit about that. And, and it's not that we need to get, quote unquote, get rid of social security numbers. Okay. Social security numbers were developed as an identifier because we have. You can have John Smith with the same date of birth, and how do we know which one of those 50, you know, thousand John Smiths is the one we're looking for? So that unique identifier, it has value, it, and we should keep that. It's not a good authenticator. It is not a secret. It's not something right. that I should pretend only I know. Right. You write it on my check when I send my tax return in. Write your number on the check. Oh, that's brilliant. Right, right. So it's not, we shouldn't pretend that this is, I'm going to, um, you business that doesn't know me and wants to make sure I am me in this first initial relationship or interaction that we're having, that's not a good authenticator. We. That's where we need to come up with a better system. And it probably has to do with layers and more layers. And it means that it won't be as frictionless for consumers. But I'm really challenging. This is one of our big challenges for 2018. We want to flip that um, security versus convenience uh, conundrum on its ear and say, no, I really want to challenge consumers to say, I'm happier that I had to jump through, the, through those hoops. I feel safer. I think you're respecting my data and my privacy and my identity more because you made it a little bit harder. Right. And right, right now it's, no, I don't want to do that because right. it's a little too... Nine seconds. I can't believe it took me nine seconds right. to get right. that done. Well, yeah. And we have all this technology. We've got fingerprint readers that we're carrying around in our pocket, I mean, there's, we've got geolocation, you know, it's this person in the place that they generally, and having, I mean, there's so many things it's beyond even more a printed piece of paper, than that. right? It's the, it's the angle at which you look at your phone when you look at it. It's the tension with which you enter your passcode, not just the passcode itself. Right. There are all kinds of very non-invasive um, biometrics, for lack of a better word. We tend to think of them as just like our face and our fingerprint, but there are a lot of other biometrics. Right. Um, that are non-invasive and not personal. They're not private. They don't feel secret, but we can use them to authenticate ourselves. And and that's the big discussion we need to be having right. is I want to be smart about my privacy. Right. And it's interesting on, on the sharing because we hear that a lot at security conferences where, you know, one of the best defenses is that teams at competing companies, security teams share data on mm -hmm. breach attempts, right? Because... Mm -hmm. Probably the same person who tried it against you is trying it against that person For is sure. trying it against that person, and 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 really an effort to try to open up um, the dialogue at that level as more of it's an us against them versus we're competing against each other in the marketplace because we both sell widgets. So are you are you seeing that? Is that something that people buy into where there's um, you know mutual benefit of sharing information to a certain level so that we can be more armed? Oh, oh for sure, especially when you talk to the folks in the risk and fraud and, and identity theft mitigation and remediation space, they definitely want more data sharing. And you know, I'm simply saying that, that, that can, that's an absolutely legitimate use for sharing data. We also need to have conversations with the people who own that data and who it belongs to. But but I think you can make that argument. People get it when I say, do you really feel like the angle at which you hold your phone is that personal? Couldn't that be helpful, that combined with 10 other data points about you, right. to help authenticate you? Do you feel like you, you're... You know, your personal business and life is being invaded by that piece of information. Or compare that to things like your health records right, and right. medical conditions that you're being Mom's treated for. Animals. Well, wow, <laughs> for sure that feels like super, super right. personal. And I think we need to do that nuance. We need to talk about what data falls into which of these, these buckets and on the bucket that isn't super personal and, and feeling invasive and that I feel like I need to protect, how can I leverage that to make myself safer? Right. Lots of opportunity. I think it's there. <laughs> All right. Eva, thanks for taking a few minutes to stop by. It's such, it's such a, a multi-layer and, and kind of complex um, problem. 
that we still feel pretty much early days at, at trying to solve. It's complicated, but we'll get there. More of, more of this kind of dialogue gets us just that much closer. All right. Well, thanks for taking a few minutes of your day. Great to see you again. Thanks. All right, Shiziva, I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE from Data Privacy Days, San Francisco.